Hello and welcome. This is a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org, a website in English about Ukraine. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I am chief editor of ukraineworld.org. We are continuing a series of podcasts about Ukrainian culture and its deep links with the European and global culture. Talking about culture is important for us because it explains in many ways what's happening now and it also provides a possible exit, a way out of today's war atrocities. This series about Ukrainian culture is supported by the delegation of the European Union to Ukraine and my guest today is Tetyana Filevska, who is creative director of the Ukrainian Institute, the key Ukrainian cultural diplomacy institution. Tetyana, good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining this podcast. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, you are the creative director of a well-known Ukrainian public institution, which is dealing with uh, cultural diplomacy, but you're also a well-known specialist in Ukrainian avant-garde and the history of Ukrainian art. So Ukrainian avant-garde is really something that we are discovering maybe in the past decades in Ukraine. Uh, we are talking about early 20th century primarily. It is very interesting artistic phenomena, but also one of the least studied and, and known globally. Uh, why do you think it is interesting to the world? What can it bring to the global cultural discussions or art discussions? Uh, well, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, speaking about the avant-garde, it was an international uh, movement and uh, uh, avant-garde developed in uh, numerous countries, um, uh, also in uh, Eastern Europe and also in what was then the Russian Empire and then the Soviet uh, uh, Soviet Empire or Soviet uh, uh, Union and uh, um, is one of the most uh, important um, and influential uh, artistic movements. Um, of course, each culture in each country had its um, um, peculiarities, uh, its uh, uh, nuances that um, give, you know, give more um, colors and more shades to the general um, image. And uh, actually, the world knows a little bit about avant-garde in Ukraine, knows the names, knows some of the phenomena, but they don't really... Uh, um, accept it, they don't really um, understand that it belongs to Ukrainian culture, because it was um, usually referred to as Russian. Everyone knows about uh, Kazimir Malevich or Archipenko or Alexandra Ekster, but they are not um, uh, considered Ukrainian artists and they are not uh, you know, given in the framework of Ukrainian culture. So what we first need to do is um, uh, uh, look at the general uh, avant-garde and see how this Ukrainian um, cultural influence depends uh, and shapes the, spe the specific avant-garde uh, culture in Ukraine. And I would also like to speak about the term a little bit, because Russian avant-garde is a kind of a brand that was shaped in uh, late 60s, uh, uh, early 70s. And uh, most of countries don't brand their avant-garde by ethnic or um, national um, identity. They refer to avant-garde in their country, let's say avant-garde in Poland, avant-garde in Czech Republic, avant-garde in Paris or in France. So uh, it's better to say also avant-garde in Ukraine instead of Ukrainian avant-garde, which is similar to, you know, appropriating like the imperialistic way uh, Russia is, is used to doing, calling it Russian avant-garde. Indeed, if we talk about Ukrainian avant-garde or avant-garde in Ukraine, as, as you suggest to say, we find people of many different ethnic backgrounds. We find uh, Jewish people, uh, people with Jewish or origins, like uh, Ziga Verto, for example, right? Or like Kultur Liga, one of the prominent avant-garde, Jewish avant-garde movements in Ukraine in the early 20th century. But we also find people with Polish origins, like Kazimir Malevich that you mentioned. So it was very multinational and multi-ethnic. Absolutely, like, you know, like the the whole population of Ukraine was and is still. Uh, Ukraine is not mono-ethnic uh, nation and never was such. Uh, the same with culture, cultural um cultural map or cultural diversity of uh, avant-garde. Um, as you mentioned, some of, uh, of the most influential, uh, influential um, uh, artists were Jewish and the Kultur Liga is, is a prominent uh, um, phenomenon in Ukrainian and international art. Um, 
some were from um, Moldova, um, some were Greek. Um, Malevich was of Polish origin. Alexandra Exter was half uh, a Greek, half uh, Belarusian. So, you know, we can we don't refer to them as ethnic Ukrainians. It's not the case. We're referring to them as part of Ukrainian culture because they either were influenced by Ukrainian culture, they um, brought a lot to 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 their circle, to their community at the time, and uh, um, we can say about their influences on the um, uh, next generation of our cultural scene in general. So let's try to tell some of the stories of these people. Uh, you mentioned already several names. Maybe it's it's difficult, of course, to make kind of a ratings top five, top ten. But m- maybe for you, as a as a scholar uh, and also as a, as an expert in art history, what are the names which are the worth important, the, the most important, what are really worth discovering. Obviously, you will start with Malevich because Malevich is one of the iconic figure for Ukrainian avant-garde, but you also is the author, you are uh, the author of one of the greatest book, uh, books about Malevich, which were published recently in Ukraine. Maybe let's start with him, who Malevich was and why he's important and maybe some other names and their stories. Yeah, absolutely. I will have to start with Malevich as he's my um, my main point of interest. And I've uh, discovered a lot of interest and facts uh, about him relating to Ukrainian culture. Um, uh, and Malevich be- related to the Polish uh, community in Ukraine that was actually settled in Ukrainian lands for at least 300 years. So they were so-called Ukrainized Polish, if we can say so. Um, the family was noble, but Malevich himself was not anymore, um, didn't have the noble status. So um, uh, his father, who uh, lost his for- fortune already at that time, the, the family um, uh, was, uh, uh, let's say, left without their mansion or, uh, or, or their funds because uh, part of the family took part in the Polish rebellion against the Russian Empire and um, Malevich's father has had to go to work and he worked at sugar factories the most developed industry in Ukraine at that time which actually has a lot of connections to the development of uh, culture uh, not only in Ukraine but also in Russian Empire uh, to remember only the pavilion uh, of Russian Empire at the Venice Biennial which was built by initiative and on the funding of uh, um, Bohdan Hanenko, the prominent collector and founder of the first public museum in Ukraine as well. Um, so Malevich was raised um, in Ukraine, uh, in usually in small villages or towns because the family had to move a lot. And he, um, he was raised or surrounded by Ukrainian culture, which did a lot of, did influence him a lot. And um, when he became the the, the artist, uh, um, the known artist already, he recognized that influence. And even if he known uh, mostly as one of the leaders of so-called Russian avant-garde, which I already talked about as as the brand more than a, a kind of a real um, movement, um, uh, he uh, considered himself being part of Ukrainian culture and called himself a Ukrainian. Um, so he's probably one of the most prominent artists in art history in, in total because he changed uh, the perception of what art is, bringing the um, the notion of um, um, art uh, which did not uh, depict anything um, existing in reality. Yeah? So he was the founder of uh, 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 objectless uh, art. Um, so of course it's it's hard to overestimate his uh, influence on um, on art history in general and particularly his role in Ukrainian art. Um, but we have to also think about and remember about other people and other names. For example, Alexander Bohomazov, who was, um, let's say, part of of the Russian speaking community in Ukraine. He did speak Russian language, but he actually never left Ukraine for longer than just a few weeks when he had to go to to teach somewhere or um, do some um, 
plein air paintings. Uh, so he spent most of his life in Kiev or around Kiev on his dacha in Boyerka, and this is what, what he painted on his futuristic paintings. Uh, Bohomazov was a great um, artist, but he was also a theoretician, and he created a, a theoretical book about uh, the, the the nature of new art, futuristic art. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to publish it. Um, if he would have, he would be probably as famous as Kandinsky, who managed to publish his uh, theoretical artwork, um, or as Kazimir Malevich himself, who also managed to, to publish some of his theoretical artworks together with his drawings. Um, Alexander Bohomazov is considered one of the greatest futurists in Europe, and I think his um, um, his over his art will get more and more recognition uh, in the next years to come. Um, Alexander Archipenko is also um, a phenomenal uh, artist we have to to recognize uh, in concern of Ukrainian culture. He was the first sculptor who brought ideas of cubism into uh, three dimensional art. Um, a part of uh, using the emptiness as an artistic mean. He also was um, a kind of an engineer and inventor, and he invented several things that uh, we nowadays use. For example, you, we all know these billboards, you know, when they, uh, they change the image because there are three dimensions of uh, of this image and they're turning around and the image is changing this is um this was invention of archipenko he called it archipentura and he created it while he already lived in united states um his life was uh, also um connected with the different countries he he, he did travel a lot as as most of the artists in the uh, first half of the 20th century. So I would say these three names um, are the must, <laughs> but of course uh, uh, we also have to, to recognize the female artists that were uh, important of the time. Alexandra Exter, who spent most of her life um, um, uh, dedicated to, to Ukraine. She spent more than 35 years in Kiev only, and eventually um, her life, um, she moved to Paris and her life ended there. Uh, she was an artist. She was a teacher. She found a school in Kiev and school in Odessa. A lot of uh, avant-garde artists went and studied at her schools, and so there was a generation of uh, students um, whom she raised and uh, and uh, taught. And she was ex at the same time very close to European colleagues. She could visit Italy and France, and she um, was um, <clears throat> acquainted and uh, quite kind of friends with uh, Picasso, with Braque, with um, many uh, famous avant-garde artists in, in Western Europe. And she brought all that to Kiev and to Ukraine, uh, to name a few. And of course, we, you know, we have to also remember about avant-garde in literature and cinema and theater and other demand and, and in other genres, because it was a very um, uh, united community cooperating in different uh, projects and uh, working together a lot and co-influencing each other so it was it was a very important and uh, interesting time in history and art history we can also among the female artists can mention probably sonia delaunay who is uh, was was spent not so ma many years in Ukraine initially. She was here as a child, but then she recognized the influence of Ukrainian colors. Maybe it's comparable to Malevich, who also recognized the influence of these peasants' colors on on his paintings. And Sonia Delaunay, who is the the founder, we can say, of simultanism, the idea of simultanism, also uh, spent a lot of time in in France and influenced very much European artistic scene uh, so this this leads me to another next question which of the ukrainian avant-gardists had global influence in your opinion of course again starting with malevich who is one of the founders of abstract art or uh, objectless uh, painting uh, sonia delaunay with her simultanism maybe among cinema of course we can mention ziga vertov or alexander dovzhenko 
Arhipenko who really changed the way how we perceive the sculpture. Maybe some other names, or you can develop on, on these names that I mentioned. Um, well, um, uh, absolutely, those names that we already mentioned, they, they had this uh, global impact. Uh, of course, we can also speak about Burluk, Burluks in general, not only as artists, but also as uh, um, cultural manager, managers and trendsetters of, of its time, uh, because they are active, um, let's say, manager managerial um, activity or energy brought a lot of important uh, um, events, exhibitions, um, uh, ideas to life. And I think uh, the avant-garde in Russian Empire or in Soviet um, uh, Union would not be as it is without their impact and influence. Uh, and also their um, house in Kherson, a region where you know a lot of things happened and a lot of artists started actually being avant-garde artists. Um, of course, you know, we have to uh, uh, admit the influence that each of these artists did in their sphere. Uh, of course, I think Malevich was the one to influence the most. But uh, at the same time, um, Alexandra Exter, for example, she was prominent in theater decoration, something, you know, very unexpectedly, but she changed the uh, the settings for, for theaters. She made it more of an engineer development. Uh, she created those, you know, moving structures. Uh, she created several layers of the stage when the act could happen at the same time on different levels. And uh, this brought a, to a totally new um, imagination uh, to theater uh, scenery and to theater direction even, I would say. Um, so I, I, I have to say that, you know, even those artists who didn't succeed to uh, influence the world uh, at their time, for example, like uh, uh, Alexander Bohomazov or uh, Mikhailo Boychuk, who some uh, scholars doubt um, his belonging, his um, relation to the avant-garde, but he was a contemporary of those artists and at some point his ideas were also kind of avant-garde and revolutionary. Uh, even if they were not recognized at that time, they um, they were prominent in those uh, um, um, in those local search they had um, or in cooperating with other artists and influence them or bringing, you know, the whole school of, um, of art in Ukraine. I also didn't mention names uh, of uh, Vladimir Tatlin and Viktor Palmov, which were also super important and interesting artists. Palmov was himself from Russia, but he... Um, inspired actually by David Burluk, he came to Ukraine, he married a Ukrainian and he stayed here until the end of his life. He was teaching in Kiev Art Institute and he brought this uh, combination of primitive art uh, or at least a primitive approach in art uh, with the avant-garde um, uh, ideas and he even you know being uh, ethnically russian he belongs to the ukrainian uh, cultural um, heritage and cultural art uh, uh, art scene uh, with his influence and uh, the the work he has done um, have very interesting works. Um, then we have to also th remember about uh, Golubatnikov, Pavlo Golubatnikov, who was teaching in Kiev Art Institute in the 20s, who was a very close uh, student of Petrov Vodkin, but then he moved to Kiev, uh, invited by the, the head of Kiev Art Institute, and he actually developed a school here as well. And we can see the um, um, the influence of this school up to date, uh, up to date, um, and Volodymyr uh, Tatlin, who um, some say was born in Kharkiv, others say he was born somewhere near Moscow. So that's a question uh, of doubt. We don't have the documents, but he nevertheless definitely uh, was was brought up in Kharkiv, and he was also like Malevich, where well. Uh, very well acquainted with Ukrainian um, folk culture. He not only played Bandura, but he also made Bandura. And it's interesting that his famous counter-reliefs, uh, those three-dimensional three dimension paintings, uh, were basically um, the parts and elements of Bandura that he uh, 
somehow put together and presented uh, as a, as an art piece. Um, uh, he also spoke uh, Ukrainian, and he even once visited Europe um, uh, as part of the national choir. He was wearing the national suit, and uh, uh, he was he pretended blind um, at the at, at that time, and uh, pretended being a blind Vandura player. Uh, so definitely Tatlin uh, also can be considered an East part of Ukrainian culture, especially considering that he was first head of the faculty on cinema, photography and uh, theater in Kiev Art Institute. He actually developed it and um, started the, the faculty. And at that time, when he worked there, he also developed uh, the first prototype of Hisli Tatlin um, uh, studying the, the the wings of um, of the birds he uh, he would catch on the side of the Dnieper River in Kiev. It's interesting that many of these artists that you mentioned, Tatlin or Bohomazov or Malevich, were also theoreticians. So uh, it leads us to the conclusion that Ukrainian avant-garde or avant-garde in Ukraine was not only not only based on colors, emotions, but also on, on very intellectual work, sometimes deeply philosophical work, visionary work. So very intellectual. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Well, I think that's uh, one of the features of avant-garde in general. That was the first type of a contextual art in art history, uh, because you wouldn't understand it without explanation. So artists started to explain their work, and this is how they started to write about their work. Um, even you know, if some couldn't actually write, like Malevich, who didn't, who wasn't educated at all, and who uh, actually was not um, familiar with written language, and so he wrote uh, the way he uh, spoke, and it's really difficult to work with his text, to be honest. Uh, but absolutely, you are absolutely right that they were all um, kind of uh, you know those great minds that wanted to create a new. Uh, world. So the utopia is is a word for them. You know, they each of them wanted to create an idea of a, of a better world, because they lived at the time when the old world was destroyed. You know, and in, in in ruins, and they imagined they used their creative imagination to. Um, see that future, that bright and beautiful future for, for people where, you know, all people would be artists and uh, poets and uh, um, um, philosophers would run uh, the world, I mean, the states. This was their dream. This leads us to contemporary times because uh, in Ukraine, uh, contrary probably to to something that is perceived in Europe or globally, in in the developed countries, we really think that the we are on the on the ruins of the old world, and these ruins are actually unfortunately very tragic for us. These are the real ruins of the of the war. So may, maybe this leads us to a new can lead us to a new interest to avant garde, and it's remarkable that it comes back in in one hundred years in in one century. But let me ask another question, is that I'm, uh, I'm asking this question, kind of a provocative maybe question to all my colleagues and friends in who are in, in art history or in cultural studies. We also talked with uh, about this a little bit with, with Olesa Ostrovska, the director of Art Arsenal recently. So my question is, I think that in Ukrainian uh, culture and in avant-garde in particular, there is no contradiction between tradition and modernity. Uh, the idea of revolution going to the future and the idea of going to the to the past. You mentioned Burluk. It's obviously that among the Burluks, the brother Burluks, there is a this movement uh, to the future, but also to the archaic past. We can we can see the same trend. It seems to me in Malevich as well, maybe in other artists that you mentioned. Do you share this idea? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, it, it absolutely is relevant to to the avant garde in Ukraine, and um, you know we can see it absolutely in Burluk and in, uh, for example, Alexandra Exter's uh, practice when she um, kind of 
<clears throat> elaborated uh, cooperation between the traditional embroidery from a small village in uh, Cher Cherkasy region with the avant-garde uh, uh, drawings of her contemporary artists, you know, so it was a combination of past and uh, uh, future. So I think that was one of the idea which was absolutely, you know, conscious for, for them. Uh, it was not something, you know, they did um, unconsciously. It was absolutely conscious and it was something the past inspired them. They didn't really didn't see any contradiction and they didn't refuse it. I mean, they, um, they were searching for um, um, inspiration in the past to create... Um, something new uh, using the new techniques the new uh, technology the new ideas and approaches so i think yeah that could be a feature of avant-garde in ukraine and maybe you know ukrainian culture in general um this combination of past and uh, future and this is an interplay between the future and the memory because uh, there are so many things that are that were subject to amnesia, forced amnesia, that uh, sometimes discovering the new for Ukrainians means also discovering of the past, of the forgotten past or, or of the lost past. Uh, because there is no kind of a, uh, archive where where you, you accumulate things, accumulate knowledge, accumulate experience. Ukrainians need to need to develop this archive. You need to... And, and, and therefore, Ukrainian culture uh, very often, not only in the avant-garde, but during the modernist era, during the romantic era, it was this combination of uh, revolutionary leaps and, uh, and the kind of archaeology. That's an interesting thing to, 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 to think about. But let me ask may maybe the last question to you, uh, you are also a, a, a well-known, well-presented person in, in Ukrainian contemporary art art scene because as in Ukrainian Institute, you, you do a lot to popularize Ukrainian art and Ukrainian culture abroad. And so when you, when you look at the contemporary Ukrainian art, do you think that in some ways it seeks in, inspiration in the Ukrainian avant-garde 100 years ago? Is there a continuity that you see? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a very um, actually. I think the idea of um, um, of this um, connection between the generation and between the different times is super important for Ukrainian society and Ukrainian art. As you mentioned before, you know this was always interrupted. This was always um, um, a forbidden life to live so we never you know had the chance to live our past to the fullest because it was at some point forbidden and broken and we had to you know start it over again and this attempt to bring it all together to stick it together to build this uh, connection between the generation is very important both for society for our um, identity both um let's say, political identity nowadays and cultural identity. Um, and I see it in many artists. They um, try to build this line of uh, uh, perception between the generations and they do find this one of the strongest points in the avant-garde and in the, in the art of first half of the uh, 20th century. Um, First of all, because, you know, we do have similar situations. We do see how the old world is breaking apart. We do see how it failed, you know, this idea of, of, um, of a world without um, any other um, um, big wars or um, a world where everyone will be, uh, I don't know, healthy and fed. You know, all of those ideas collapsed and um, artists try to find the moment when there was still hope that this is possible. And I think that the last point was in the beginning of 20th century when artists did believe that everything is possible and they can imagine the, the, the perfect future. And they're trying to understand, you know, how they created this vision and trying to build some kind of... Um, uh, position for themselves even if it's not utopia anymore if it's more of a social critical art but they still relate to those let's say humanistic ideas uh, those universal ideas that avant-garde artists were searching for and basically found when they um, created their um, system of, of art and system of world <laughs> 
When you look at the contemporary Ukrainian art, probably you could also uh, tell our audience some of the names which you think uh, are really worth uh, following, especially those that are in this continuity with Ukrainian avant-garde 100 years ago. Um, well, if we are speaking about today's um, scene, and um, uh, I have to say maybe that at some point every Ukrainian contemporary artist had their dialogue with the, the artist artist of the past. And it's really hard, you know, to pick one um, um, example. But, uh, um, for example, now at the Venice Biennial, our um, pavilion, Ukrainian pavilion, is presented by a, a wonderful Ukrainian artist, Pavlo Makov, who presents his Fountain of Exhaustion. And actually, uh, Markov is from Kharkiv, and his work is uh, um, locally... Um, found it, you know, it's it's uh, rooted in the local history of Kharkiv and Kharkiv was the capital of Ukrainian avant-garde, at least literary avant-garde in the 20s, back then when Kharkiv was also the first uh, uh, capital of Soviet Ukraine. Um, so, um, you won't you won't find like direct citations in in uh, Pavlo's um, work to, to the um, avant-garde, but he was raised, you know, in this uh, in the city, in this community that remembered how this whole generation of avant-garde was destroyed, was um, literally killed um, with uh, with the, the, the bullets of Soviets. Um, so um, other names, uh, I would say, um, important and uh, interesting to follow, Aleftina Kahidza, an artist uh, who has... Um, not a very typical ethnical Ukrainian name, would say, but who is so Ukrainian that at the moment she represents Ukraine everywhere in many institutions, museums, and uh, she speaks for, for Ukraine and for Ukrainian culture a lot. Aleftina is drawing a lot uh, about her own perception. Uh, she has... Um, she lives not far from Kiev, and she was drawing... Um, a lot during the first uh, few months of war, her experience of, uh, you know, surviving in these uh, um, awful circumstances. Um, um, another artist of a more, uh, let's say, older generation who is considering himself um, um, an, a man of an objectless art, Tiberi Silvashi, who is um, uh, also um, has Hungarian roots and is not ethnically pure Ukrainian, you would say, yeah, um, who, who lives in Kiev and is part of Ukrainian, a very important Ukraine, Ukrainian artistic movement. He spent uh, all of his um, uh, time during the war in Kiev and he has been taking photographs out of his window and sometimes even out of the window of his workshop, his studio. He's doing uh, objectless art, uh, very beautiful pieces as well. Uh, Vlada Ralko, um, uh, another great name of a Ukrainian contemporary artist. Uh, younger generation artists like Nikita Kadan, Lesa Khomenko, uh, Lada Nakonechna, uh, they used to be part of the rap group um, um, and a lot famous a lot during the Orange Revolution and after that. And now each of them are um, having their own career and working um, by themselves. Um, of course, uh, you know, those artists that... Um, represent uh, Odessa, like Alexander Reutburg, who uh, just recently passed away and he spent his life between Odessa and Kyiv. Um, uh, I would like to also me mention someone from Western Ukraine, from Lviv, uh, maybe um, Serhii Petluk, maybe, you know, um, um, or um, there are also artists that are working in... Um, um, uh, with clay and a lot with pottery uh, because in Lviv there was a famous uh, school of pottery and clay and they are doing artistic sculptural work uh, with them. Um, I mean, Ukrainian art, contemporary artistic scene is very diverse and I'm happy that more and more artists get displays, get their um, works exhibited um, in the um, ex in, in the museums and centers and galleries outside of Ukraine. Um, this is excellent. <laughs>
And they, it continues to be very multi-ethnic, multinational, because you mentioned Silva Shi, who has Hungarian origins, uh, uh, Aliftina Kahidze has a Georgian uh, last name, uh, the Roitburt and uh, Matvei Weisberg, for example, they have Jewish origins, right? Uh, yeah. So you, Ukrainian yeah. Jewish, yeah. Ukrainian Hungarian, Ukrainian Georgian, this is all uh, all very, very typical. Yeah, yeah, and Jana Kadyrova, for example, whom I didn't mention, but she's also a very active part of Ukrainian scene. And, you know, Kadyrova is a quite a famous name, um, last name. Thank you so much, Tetiana. This is, um, let's consider this as a kind of a short introduction into Ukrainian avant-garde. Uh, there are many things to discover for our international audience Uh I hope we'll continue these conversations uh, afterwards as well and deep, deep, uh, dig deeper into Ukrainian culture. We had Tetyana Filevska, who is a creative director of Ukrainian Institutes, Ukraine's major institution in uh, uh, cultural diplomacy. This was a Ukraine Explaining Ukraine podcast by ukraineworld.org. This was a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org, a website in English about Ukraine. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I am chief editor of ukraineworld.org. This series about Ukrainian culture and its links to the European culture is supported by the delegation of the European Union to Ukraine. You can support our podcast at Patreon, patreon.com slash ukraineworld. You can also listen to us at Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, You can follow us on social networks, Twitter and Facebook. Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest and oldest Ukrainian media NGO. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.